I've been fascinated for the last five years or so by the, the connections between spiritual religious perspectives and climate change as an issue. It's, the issue is so all-encompassing. It's, until recently, we've talked about it as being an in invisible crisis. Uh, now it's becoming increasingly visible, but there's still a sense in which it's hard to engage people with an issue that they can't see in their backyard. So spiritual perspectives, I think, can be extremely helpful in helping us to, to engage with and to ask questions such as, who are we as humans on the planet today? How are we called to change uh, by this crisis? And what perspectives might motivate us to change? The writer Jonathan Schell, a number of years ago in writing about nuclear weapons, uh, posed this sort of existential spiritual dilemma to that issue in a way that still speaks to me today. And I want to begin with a quote of his because it just resonates so powerfully. Talking about extinction, Schell said, extinction therefore threatens not so much each person's life as the meaning of our lives. It threatens life with meaninglessness as individual death never can. In doing so, it not only encompasses all human life, but reaches deep into each of our lives, requiring each of us to make this business his or her own. The eternal has been placed at stake in the temporal realm, and the infinite has been delivered into the care of finite human beings. Another person who's really amplified this sense for me is Brian Swim, who worked with Mary, Mary Evelyn on the, the film The Journey of the Universe. And Swim said, I think this was also a number of years ago, writing about nuclear weapons, but again, applicable today. The terrifying image of an Earth gone black is psychic food for the human species. It brings us the energy that we need to reinvent ourselves as the mind and heart of the planet. And Mary Evelyn, when you were talking about uh, Confucianism and the, the mind and heart of the cosmos this morning, I was thinking about that and just the task that this poses for us, how, how, do, we, um, how do we take that on it, it, as a deep spiritual task? And so this suggests that, that, that these questions have a profound spiritual dimension to us. Religious groups have been at the forefront of most social change movements uh, social justice issues and civil rights and peace particularly come to mind, so it seems natural that religious groups would have an important role to play in relation to climate change. Uh, and uh, we've seen, oh, Mary Evelyn did a wonderful job this morning of showing those connections between spiritual and environmental questions. So today I'd like to zero right in on a very concrete project I've been involved with called the Carbon Fast. And uh, this began about five years ago when I started meeting with a group of, of religious, interfaith uh, religious leaders in the Brattleboro area. Some of them were from the United Church of Christ, a Jewish religious leader, and um, also a Quaker. And we were looking for a way to make this very concrete and practical. So one of the members of our group had heard about the Carbon Fast through an English nonprofit called Tear Fund. And we decided to develop a, a Carbon Fast that would be kind of applicable to our local scene. So we, we used a, a local, um, local issues, uh, local resources to develop this idea where each day you get a different assignment. And you each got one now in your hand. I hope, did everybody get one? Uh, each day you get a different assignment, so to speak, some activity that helps you reduce your carbon footprint. And we did this in the context of Lent, which is often a time of renunciation and spiritual discipline. Instead of giving up chocolate or coffee or something like that, we suggested giving up carbon. So uh, let's take just a few minutes. I thought since this was the middle of the afternoon, we could do something where you get to move a little bit. So everybody who the, the task that you've been given, if it's something that you already do on a regular basis in your life, stand up. Great. Let, could a couple of you just shout them out, just so we'll have a sense of what some of these things we're already doing as that part of a carbon fast? Just buy locally grown food. Great. Say no to bottled water. Great.
Great. Cut down on eating meat. Great, we've heard about that and we're practicing that here, so. Adjust the thermostat according to whether people are at home or not. Great. Plant a tree. Plant a tree. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, let's just, I want to get a brief sampling of different levels of commitment of these. If you hold something that you haven't yet done but think you really ought to be doing or would like to be doing or should be doing, if you could stand up. Oh, good. Let's hear what a few of those are then. <coughs> uh, clean or replace curve filters is recommended. Replacing the dirty furnace filter can save 15% of the energy used. Okay. Address your standby habits. Unplug mobile phone chargers and unused appliances. 8% of the electricity consumed at home is from vampire appliances that we aren't even using. <laughs> yes, thanks. I have line dryer in my clothes. <laughs> what was that? Line dryer in my clothing. <laughs> my favorite carbon fast story is about a couple in Dummerson, Vermont, who got that one last winter last winter when there were three feet of snow, and they snowshoed out to their clothesline. <laughs> so there, there you go, that's the goal. So, uh, Anybody else want to add, add one, something that you, yeah? Take action, find out who your elected representatives are and tell them uh, what you're doing through the carbon fast. Urge them to create and implement strong national and international laws to stop climate chaos. That's Great, fine. That's thanks, fine. yeah. Yeah. Well, with uh, a lot of thinking, actually, we. Oh, no, I, I, I oh how do you get this all? Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you at the end. So stick around. Yeah. Um, is there anybody else that didn't wasn't in one of those two categories that might be in a third category that I haven't yet thought of? Yeah. I'll train somebody. I have to give up my car. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Mine was remove one light bulb, mm. and that uh, seemed a little odd to me. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I'm glad you. Yeah. Yeah. Mine asked me to, if I stop more than 10 seconds, don't idle my car. I drive an Insight, so I don't need to Oh, good. So okay. I, I don't really feel like I have succeeded. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, you don't need to, so. Okay, well I want to take another leap now. Thanks, that was great to hear some of your responses and uh, you'll hear more about how you can find out about this. Where the story got really exciting for me was it became a, a sort of a mustard seed metaphor, if you know the parable of the mustard seed from the Bible where something small becomes big. Uh, what happened in a group of uh, environmentally interested clergy last year uh, we began discussing this project from the Brattleboro area and somebody said, well, let's put that online and see what happens to it. So last year, the Massachusetts Conference of the United Church of Christ took it on as a project to make it an online program. They developed this in a more, they took out the local pieces of Brattleboro, Vermont and made it relevant to the whole, um, the whole New England and put it out on, um, on the web and then it got onto Facebook, and by the time Lent rolled around, 6,000 people were signed up for this. So I was just amazed when, when that happened. And then once it got onto Facebook, it, we didn't have any way of tracing, so who knows how many people were doing it. Um, so in the meantime, the, the, there's a research piece of this, and since this is a symposium about research, I wanted to, to share the story of this research project that developed. This is a very low, um, kind of low-tech research project that we, I, we would call qualitative research, where no statistics, interviews, questionnaires, and just conversations with people in focus groups, which was fascinating. And a group of four of us, a psychologist, an environmental activist, myself, a teacher, and a filmmaker, worked together to develop this, this set of questionnaires and interviews. And... Um, I'll get back to the light bulb now. The, the first thing that we found was how much of an impact this unscrewing the light bulb had on people. We posed it as the first day's task because it kind of set the tone as a symbolic action. One woman described this, with, uh, doing this with her son. 
we put it in a small vase on the dining room table so that every day we would be reminded of the fast. People would come in and ask about it, and my son would tell them why it was there. So for them, it clearly had a symbolic action. Uh, for others, it was noted as a daily reminder of, of why they'd taken this on. And uh, so even though it's not a very significant action energy-wise, it had a big impact for people. This significance of a small action pointed to our first major discovery, that small actions can have powerful effects on people's awareness. Many reported that the fast helped them to become more aware of the impacts of their daily actions, more conscious of their use of energy. One person wrote, every day I was thinking about my use of water, electricity, and gas. That was a great awareness invoking practice. I felt more attuned to how my actions impact my world. That joined up with my socially ethical practice and so I found myself praying about a greater variety of my actions to help me find my way to being more environmentally responsible. Another reflected on this process in her, in her experience of the fast. The facts and explanations, some of you read the little factual deals that came along with that. Uh, these daily suggestions were mind expanding about one's effect on the environment as well as the effect on my personal consumption. Now I pay closer attention to turning off lights, purchasing any energy efficient items wherever possible, looking at landscaping to limit consumption of carbon energy in a different way, carbon based energy. Bottom line, I'm much more aware of what I can do to limit carbon emissions and I'm trying to implement those changes wherever I can. This connection between awareness, action and commitment correlates well with what we, we had been anticipating based on the stages of change theory, which the basic idea there grew out of, um, of addictions work that uh, we've talked about this before, uh, that you give people a lot of information, you tell them they should change, and they actually, uh, in addictions work, it actually is counterproductive. And uh, so we were curious to see how, whether giving people simple actions and the, uh, support community they could act as a part of would, um, would help them to, to make changes that they might not make changes just on the basis of information. So these actions resulted in a transformation of the people who take them. When they begin to see themselves as agents who take action, the change in self-perception is a crucial part of empowering citizens to become engaged. If people are motivated to take even simple actions, such as changing a light bulb, it can help them feel empowered and transform the way they see themselves. One participant summarized the value of this process as a stimulus to personal growth. Quote, every time we're given an opportunity to see how our daily actions support or don't support our values, we grow. We were also curious to see to what degree the fast was spiritually significant for the participants. Several people mentioned the idea of sacrifice in a positive context, a whole lot more meaningful than giving up something like chocolate, said one person. Another person remarked that Lent is a time to be reminded of sacrifice and the unification that can come through that process. Changing from being in my car to riding my bike through, riding my bike brought me the joy of moving my body, of seeing my neighbors, of having contact with a non-human world around me. So the fast led to a heightened spiritual and environmental awareness for many. I often thought about what I was doing for God's and our earth, wrote one person, and found that to be spiritually rewarding. I haven't fasted during Lent for some time, and it felt good to find a practice that meant something to me and hopefully to the community. Another reflected on the spiritual importance for her. Quote, doing it during Lent made it feel more present. I felt more deliberate about making changes and had a greater sense of accomplishment. When I have doubts about the success of my activism and educational efforts to get people to save energy, I draw strength from the conviction that I'm doing God's work. On a more comic note, I also got some comments about Jesus, this is still in this person writing, and his carbon footprint at the time. Someone said to me, Jesus would have driven a Prius. 
And I said back, Jesus would have walked. One person summed it up in words that could be a headline for this project. I consider anything that we do to reduce our carbon footprint as highly spiritual. So one person had this to say about the overall impact of the experience, and I close with this quote. Giving up candy, a frequent childhood recommendation, or some other material thing, just didn't seem to address the idea of Lent and its focus on the spiritual in a meaningful way. But as we live in times of environmental change and a growing ecological awareness, this seemed appropriate and right. I like the idea of deepening our spiritual awareness by connecting the dots. We live in the world, and our caring for the world is also a part of spirit and of caring for each other. I love that image of connecting the dots, and it reminds me of a statement that I heard David Suzuki make years ago giving a talk about the environment that religion and ecology make natural partners because they're both about making connections. We were encouraged by the evidence that the carbon fast helped people to respond creatively to the emotional challenges of living in a time of climate change. Learning about climate change can lead to paralysis, and we've talked about these emotional issues here a lot. But it helps to have a focused activity, such as the fast, to help people deal with those feelings. A participant commented that I always feel overwhelmed by facts and statistics, and I tend not to read that stuff but that the fast engaged me on the level of my creativity and my imagination, and that made me want to participate. So instead of despair, denial, or paralysis, one person said, I feel a sense of hope that making these changes, having a daily reminder to people, and putting it into spiritual practice, that the idea of faith in action might actually help change our path from one of self-annihilation to salvation, if you will. So we were encouraged greatly by these positive responses and are eager to um, explore this further. The fast is happening again. It begins next Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, a week from yesterday. You can sign up for it by going to the Massachusetts Conference of the UCC. It's M-A-C-U-C-C dot O-R-G. Uh, and they have a, a page on their website for the ecumenical carbon fast. Uh, there's quotes from last year's participants that sort of march across the page in little moving sequences. It's quite cleverly done. And there's a Facebook page. You can send it out to your friends by Facebook. Uh, so we're interested in exploring this uh, further uh, with this year's fast. We're interested in the longitudinal, the longitudinal long-term question, whether people re uh, participating in the fast uh, more than one year, whether that will have a more lasting, more profound uh, effect. Uh, will people's lives change over the long haul? Will small lifestyle changes lead to deeper transformation into taking steps as activists or other more substantial changes? And then I think to go back to the larger question we've been addressing, might a project like this help support a groundswell of interest and activism among faith communities, so that along with other groups like Green Faith, Interfaith Power and Light, faith communities will indeed take an increasingly active role in addressing the challenge of climate change. So thank you.